Patrick, free will, consciousness, these are two of the biggest questions in, uh, in the philosophy of mind. As an experimental neuroscientist, how do they relate, free will, consciousness? Sure. So first of all, I think we wouldn't necessarily need to talk about free will to answer that question. So we can just talk about voluntary action. I don't know whether the will is free or not. That's a pretty hard question to answer. But we can think about voluntary action as being a, a chain of events which lead all the way from the development and preparation of an action in the frontal lobes of the brain mm -hmm. through to the execution of action, the dispatch of a motor command from the primary motor cortex to the muscles of the opposite side of the body and through to the consequences of that action. So for example, if my finger is on a button or even worse on a trigger, then that action could have pretty important consequences. And we can ask at what stage in that processing chain between the initial development of an action and the consequences of the action, do we become conscious and what are we conscious of? So the first thing to point out is that a lot of our movements are really rather automatic and sure. produce either a very thin experience, which is hardly accessible, or, or possibly no experience at all. So we don't have a particularly vivid experience of a lot of our own actions. We don't particularly experience our own breathing or walking or changing gear on a car as being uh, an intense uh, conscious experience. But sometimes we can. So some of our actions we do experience uh, extremely uh, intensely. And you know anybody who has uh, had the experience of giving somebody a first kiss, you know, <laughs> that, that can be pretty salient. That can generate a very vivid conscious experience. Now, where does that come in? Does it come in only in terms of the movements of our body and the physical consequences of our actions or do we experience some kind of consciousness before we do things? Now, I'm perhaps slightly unusual because most neuroscientists have emphasized the experience of our actual bodily movements and their consequences. But I think that we experience something about our actions, slightly at least, before we make them. So I think the processes in the frontal parts of the brain which develop and plan and uh, progress our actions towards an actual body movement, I think those can sometimes generate a conscious experience as well. I don't know why. We certainly need to avoid the kind of dualistic explanation that there's some kind of ghost in the machine or little man in the head who has mm -hmm. the experience and then mm -hmm. says, stop, don't do it. That, that wouldn't make sense. Um, but I think there is an experience of our action rather in the same way that the visual areas of the brain give an experience of what we see. Now, if we look at these frontal parts of the brain, there's a rather interesting feature of their anatomy. There are basically two circuits in the front parts of the brain which both project back onto the primary motor cortices mm -hmm. that actually make my body move. So in the lateral part of the frontal lobes, you have a set of brain areas which receive projections from the sensory brain and tell us how to respond to stimuli in the environment. So for example, um, reaching for a cup of coffee, or um, perhaps if you were to attack me, mm -hmm. they would be involved in defending myself mm -hmm. uh, from you. So they're really about stimulus-oriented behaviors. But in the middle, the medial frontal part of the brain, in the sort of central part of each hemisphere, there's a set of brain areas which seem to be concerned much less with responding to the external world, but more responding to sort of internal needs, motivations, hmm. things we want to do. And they have a rather different connectivity. They're not connected to the sensory areas of the brain. They're connected to the, the reward areas, the drive areas, and the emotional areas hmm. of the brain. Hmm. So I think this medial frontal circuit is key because I think it makes our actions, some of our actions, internally generated, something which comes in some sense internally rather from the external world. And I think those areas can, at least sometimes, also give us the particular conscious experience of this is what I want to do, this is what I'm about to do. And I think it's also interesting to consider whether that conscious experience could play any role in the judgment of should I do this or not. So that would mean that the medial system 
is generating what would be self-generated as opposed to the lateral systems being a, responding to stimuli in, in, a, in, a, in a stimulus response manner. That's absolutely right. And I think one of the interesting neuroscientific challenges is to work out what do we mean by self-generated. Yeah, so we need to be a little right. bit suspicious of self, right. you know, where's the right, self, right, it's, right. A bit, it's a bit like a ghost in the machine. So what are these internally generated actions? Well, I think, at least in human psychology, that there are probably three pretty important ingredients which can help us to understand and explain the actions that I might make not because of some immediate sensory stimulus, not because of, for example, a reflex to right, defend myself right, right. or to orient towards something, but actions which, which are coming from within. So the first one, I think, which is very important is memory. And I think people have rather ignored the fact that the will can be trained. We can learn mm, mm. what to do in a given situation. Mm. So very often, if there's no immediate sensory cue making me do something, I'll do what I did before. I'll recognize, oh yes, last time I was in this situation, I did X, I'll do X again. Or maybe if I did X before and I was punished, I should do Y this right, time. Right. So I think uh, our learned, um, our ability to learn what action to make in any particular circumstance is certainly relevant to the idea of internal generation. The second thing, which is really important, I think, for understanding human intelligence generally, is the idea of innovation. A very f useful feature of the human brain is it doesn't always do exactly the same thing as mm. it did last time. It sometimes does something a little bit different. This has its basis in very basic mechanisms of animal foraging. So even if you feed an animal well, it will still look to mm -hmm. see if it can get slightly <laughs> better food elsewhere. That's perhaps you know, a possibility for improved survival and indeed for progress. So mm. maybe there's a, an, something about the way our brain is wired up, which is encouraging us to you know, try that out. And clearly that's something which will be part of the internal generation of voluntary action. Mm. And the third thing, which is again a basic mechanism of the brain, is the brain is a noisy system. So it's not a perfect system. Sometimes the spontaneous activity of neurons in the frontal lobes of the brain may just trigger an action. Maybe there's nothing we can even do about it. Maybe some of our actions just have a random quality because of neural noise. So the neural noise, your third mechanism, actually could be a, a way to generate the, the second, the innovation, the creativity, because neural noise sort of forces you to do other things and creativity would seem to be critical in survival because even though what you're doing works, it may not always work. And so those that can do, are, are forced by neural noise or whatever to do different things, under different circumstances would be uh, uh, selected for. You're absolutely right. Neural noise could have a beneficial function because it could be one of the mechanisms of creativity. Of creativity. But neural noise is going to be there anyway, mm -hmm. simply because you're working with a, a biological machine which mm -hmm. is trying to generate actions and perform computations with, with ions and with <laughs> chemicals. So the neural noise is inevitable, but it may be that it has a useful function mm. of occasionally triggering an mm. interesting new behavior, which might be perhaps sometimes quite successful. So feeding it all back, you, you have volition, you have consciousness. Uh, how effective is understanding volition in shedding light on what consciousness is? So I think there you're using the word consciousness in a very general sense, not to mean a specific conscious experience, but perhaps the general experience of being human or of being you. <laughs> or, or to have an inner subjectivity at all. So I think volition really is perhaps at the cornerstone of our mental life, because I think the experiences that we have are inevitably strongly linked to what we do and to the consequences of what we do. So I think when we talk about our inner subjectivity or what it's like to be me, a lot of what we actually mean is the f feelings and thoughts we have about the decisions we've made, the things we've done, the things we regret, the impacts we've had on other people, the impacts that other people have had on us. And all of those ultimately are gonna come down to particularly significant internally generated actions, things which I would say are probably coming out of our medial frontal lobe. Mm -hmm. 
and which have had a big knock-on effect on a lot of what happens next. So the fact that those actions came from the voluntary motor system, the fact that we experienced a sense of agency when we made those actions, that we know that that action had, for example, an effect on somebody else. I think those are all markers which mean that the set of events surrounding those actions are going to be strongly uh, dominant in the record, if you like, that our brain keeps of, of our lives in our autobiographical memory. I think a lot of what we remember, and perhaps the reason why remem we remember, is we have, have a memory of what we did. Then we can ask, why do we have this rich sense of mm -hmm. our own conscious experience? Why do we remember so clearly what we did and what happened to us? And I think that that, again, may be related to volition. If we can remember our past experiences, and if we have a particularly vivid conscious trace of them, that may help, that may be useful for the next set of decisions we have to make. That may be useful for giving us a clear feeling of now we're in a particular situation where we have to make a decision and where we may be responsible for the outcome of that decision. And this is a case where we need to integrate all of the possible information that's relevant to that decision. And we better make the right one because the actions that we make really have a very strong effect both on our own lives and in a social environment on the lives of others. So this has an impact on the, a possible reason for consciousness. A lot of the philosophical discussions and even scientific ones go radically in each direction, but nobody knows why is it there. And this could be a possibility. I don't know why it's there perhaps any more than the next person, but we think it's there for a reason because otherwise it wouldn't have uh, lasted through evolution. And it does seem to me really quite interesting that we talk about consciousness in two senses. We talk about this integrative way in which a person has a consciousness, which is clearly built up out of their past history. But we also talk about the specific conscious mm -hmm. experiences and conscious thoughts that they have and that they make. And here we're interested particularly at the points of decisions, their consciousness at the point of action and mm -hmm. decision. Mm -hmm. Now, there's got to be a link between the two in my mind. In our experiments in the laboratory, we study these very short-term little moments of conscious experience associated with trivial actions like pressing buttons. But our actions stem from the experiences that we've built up in our past life. And I would like to really understand what's the connection between the consciousness in the first sense of the, the learning and the memory that I've built up about what I can do. And the experience of that, the inner subjectivity of that. And then how I use that in the situation I'm in now, where I'm forced to do something, and where what I do may be really important, not least because you and society may hold me responsible. So consciousness one and consciousness two, and there must be a link between them, and I'd be delighted to see if we can try and find out experimentally some of how that works.